I, I guess that's one thing that has definitely changed the prices of things. Uh, you know, I used to go and get a bowl of fur for five thousand dong. If if it was more than five thousand, you know, come on, you know, you're charging me foreigner prices and get out of town. And uh, and at some point, another Vietnamese person rang him. We were we were on a train, and so he answered the phone in Vietnamese. And someone on the train started abusing him for speaking another language. Uh, and 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 this this woman was was was. Kind of shouting, you know, this is Australian. You should be speaking Australian, which, first of all, was kind of a funny thing for him to be saying. But um, you know, here in Vietnam, it's it is not always perfect with with language, and and sometimes the translation is terrible. But there's a real effort, and you know, you, you wouldn't see that in in a lot of Western countries that that effort to be inclusive of of foreign languages that are that are being spoken. We're, in a lot of ways, we're spoiled as, as expats in the Hoyan came to Hanoi and was complaining about how everyone was overcharging him and, and trying to rip him off and giving him a bum steer because he was not a local. And, you know, as, as foreigners, we think that sometimes we're overcharged or, 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 you know, we're taken for a ride because we're foreigners. But actually, Vietnamese people have the same experience when they travel because their accent gives them away. It's another one of those nuances that, that you don't know when you first come. I, so I was born in Sydney. And, and then when I was about 12, my family moved 600 kilometers out of, out of the city to a really remote area. And I was living, living on this little farm. Um, and, and for my final two, two years of high school, I had a 60 kilometer drive each way to get to school and then to get home. So, you know, really remote. And into this remoteness, one day appeared a family of Vietnamese refugees. They had, they had left by boat, ended up in Malaysia. And from Malaysia went to Inverell in northwest New South Wales. And, you know, they'd been through language training and whatnot. But, I mean, they were shocked, absolute culture shock. Um, and, and it was a, re a really classic, uh, you know, Australian town, mostly white people. I, I was considered foreign because of my surname. Um, you know, and I, and I didn't speak any other language other than English. And, and so I kind of thought, why don't I help out? And, and so I got tutoring these, um, these students and, and helping with their English and learning their story, which was, in, it was just incredible to me. They'd been attacked by pirates. They'd, they'd lived in, in camps in Malaysia. And, and I had no idea. I, I was, I mean, I was living in poverty and hardship. But listening to what they were going through, I felt, wow, I'm, I'm sheltered. And, and so, you know, that sparked an interest in Vietnam. So I eventually rented a house and, uh, and I started running classes out of the top top floor of my house. Uh, now, my, my landlady just absolutely hated this. Every Sunday afternoon, this group of kids would come along and it, it turned into about 14 kids. And, you know, they'd have their shoe shine boxes. They'd be dirty. Sometimes they'd come covered in blood. You know, they'd been in a fight or something. She was mortified that, you know, she thought renting her house to a foreigner meant everything was going to be dignified. And, and here he was, running a class for, for street kids. But my university students would be there and, and we'd go off for a meal afterwards. And, you know, we got to know these kids and, and eventually, like, we, we couldn't fit anymore in that classroom. So someone said, well, why don't, we, why don't we take it to the field? Why don't we rent a football field and, and we'll play football and then we'll have a healthy meal and, and then we'll teach English after that. And, and so we started doing that. The, um, the English lessons after football only ever lasted once. <laughs> <laughs> Turned out they weren't interested in that once, once they could play football. But we still play football. You know, nearly 20 years later, we, we still play that, that game of football every Sunday. In fact, now it's through the week as well on, on different nights of the week. Um, but, you know, that was how it started. It was just a case of, look, here are these kids. They're hungry to learn. And, and when I looked back on my own experience as a child, 
you know, living on that farm, when, when we moved there, um, we didn't have, there was no house or anything. There. We lived in, in caravans, what, you know, what American people call trailers on, on this land. There wasn't even electricity or running water. We, we were poor. And, and, and then here I am with these kids and I realized if I had been born here in Vietnam, this would be me. Realization of being like, like this is on me. Like if, I, if I've identified this as a problem, then I need to do it. Was that scary? Sometimes it was scary because we had no idea what, what we were going to do. Uh, I mean, none of us. The, in the end, there were a couple of main people. There was me and, and another guy named Chung. Now, Chung lives in the US now. He runs a, uh, a tr he has a translation company there. Uh, and, and he's the president of Blue Dragon USA. And there was, you know, there was a, a Spanish guy named Gonzalo and some other Vietnamese volunteers. Um, none of us had done anything like this. And, and we found that, by the way, as we went out looking for support, everyone kind of fell into these two camps. One group would look at us and say, you have no idea what you're doing. You know, there's no way we're going to support this. And other people would look at it. And by the way, especially American people would, would say, hey, that's a great idea. Let me help you <laughs> to share really openly. I, I had a call just recently from, from somebody wanting to start a street kids project in Ho Chi Minh City. Um, and, and I made sure that, that our... The, the, the guy who leads our street kids work here, who, who himself was a street kid, who I met in 2003, that he was on the call as well. Um, so, so that experience really, it, it made me think, if only people had helped me, so I'm going to help others. So there's a, there was a, a positive outcome to that hard lesson in the early days. Was there ever a point where you thought about giving up? Oh, yeah, yeah, absolutely.